Okay. All right, so um, we can begin. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Camilo Otero, Artist Programs Manager at Center for Book Arts in New York. Before we begin this program, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on ancestral unceded territory of the Leni Lenape people. For those of you who are new to CBA, Center for Book Arts is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to supporting the book arts through exhibitions, educational programs, studio access, and a library uh, specialized in book arts. This event is being live streamed to our YouTube channel. Please, uh, if you uh, don't wish to appear, um, turn your cameras off and remain muted. Tonight we present Human Artifacts 2023 Spring Broadside Reading Series curated by Alison Parrish. This is the second session of two happening over Zoom last Thursday and today. This reading is part of a series that has been going on for more than 20 years, and it gives the opportunity to visual artists and poets to work together. Alison Parrish is a computer programmer, poet, and game designer whose teaching and practice address the unusual phenomena that blossom when language and computers meet. She is an assistant art professor at NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program. According to Ars Technica, Alison's work delights everyone. She was named Best Maker of Poetry Bots by The Village Voice in 2016, and her zine of computer-generated poems called Compasses received an honorary mention in the 2021 Pre-Ars Electronica. Alison is the co-creator of the board game Rewardable, Claxon Potter, uh, Clarkson Potter 2017, and uh, author of several books, including At Every Word, the book In Start in 2015, and Articulations, Counterpath 2018. Her poetry has recently appeared in Bomb Magazine and Strange Horizons. Allison is originally from West Bountiful, Utah, and currently lives in Brooklyn. I'd like to thank our funders and everyone who donated to support this event and people who bought the broadside. The broadsides are available at a special price until the end of the session, and I will post the links in the chat for you. Welcome, Madison. Uh, great. Thank you for that introduction, Milo. Um, I actually have a little slide deck that I'm going to bring up to present or to introduce the session. Um, it's kind of the same thing that I said for the last session, so apologies to anyone that was here for both. Um, one second. Share my screen like it's 2020. Um, all right. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Center for Book Arts um, for this amazing opportunity to curate these artists and poets and writers and uh, so forth. Um, I'd also like to give a little bit of a thanks for uh, the Center for Book Arts for letting us have this event online. Um, I think that even though most people have moved back to in-person events, having it online gives us the option of having international participants um, participation from people all over the globe, which is great. Um, also, there are vanishingly few COVID safe events in the New York City art scene, um, which it's good to have this one uh, where I can fully participate. Um, I'd also like to thank the artists and designers uh, and of course the, the, the poets and the writers uh, for their contributions. Honestly, um, I'm so excited about the broadsides now that I can see all of them on the website. They're all just completely amazing. Um, and the 
every single one of my like top choices to participate accepted. Uh, and I kind of can't believe I'm just like super excited about um, the group that that uh, we were able to bring together for this. I think it's like just all of the heavy hitters that I want to have uh, producing uh, artwork. Um, so I'm going to give a little brief introduction to my my curation of the series, and then uh, we're going to have readings and uh, little explanations uh, from the poets and the artists. The order that we're going to go in is Josie first, and then Janelle, and then Kay. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the, the writer and the artist, uh, have them talk, and then introduce the next writer and the artist. So it'll control will come back to me between each uh, each reader. Um, all right, so uh, in curating the series, I was thinking about this quote from Robert Pinsky, who said, I find the computer utterly a uh, human artifact. It reeks of us, as do our trombones and cars and scissors and parades and pizzas. Technology is exactly like humanity. It is our baby and we are its. What I like about this quote is, first of all, the insistent on the insistence on the materiality of computers and computation and in, in general, and thinking about um, computers as something that reek uh, is just really visceral in a way that I find uh, to be interesting and important. Um, and also thinking about, we, we often think of technology as being something that is very abstract. Um, that's just like this binary logic and exists in the cloud and we can't see it and we can't feel it. Um, but Pinsky here is emphasizing the fact that, that it is an extension of us and it looks like something and it feels like something. Um, and it results from the decisions that people have made and the affordances of how people interact with things in the world, just like trombones and cars and scissors and parades and pizzas. Um, so my curatorial statement starts with that quote from Pinsky and I go on to say, the poets, writers and artists in the series use uh, this human artifact, the computer to produce creative texts. Some provoke machine learning models, others write alongside them. Some shape digital texts from the ground up bit by bit while others use the internet to facilitate community participation. We find that the concerns and the aura of their works are unmistakably human, not despite their use of computation, but because of it. And I wanna dig into that a little bit more. We are now in um, a very interesting era of uh, computer generated art. Computer generated art is a very, very old field, older than people think it is. Um, even by like the strict definition of the term of, of computational art being art produced with a computer, we have nearly a hundred year history of that. Um, and if we go to like less precise definitions of that, you could make arguments for many kinds of, of computational processes performed even without a computer to fall under that rubric. Uh, nevertheless, in the moment, um, we're in the situation where uh, we've sort of fallen into these two camps. And on the one side is the um, large language model maximalists uh, of open AI and so forth. And I have the boo and the hiss and the ug here. You can imagine the, the striking workers of the writer's union um, saying those words and also a lot of other people, I have to say. Tim Nitgebru is over here uh, uh, saying those same things. Um, and that's one side of the equation. And on the other side of the equation, the equation is pure and wholesome old style computer writing, um, which you can only get through, you know, pure and wholesome old style writing, writing methods. Um, whenever a binary comes up like this, like a taxonomy like this comes up, often what it ends up doing is not just setting up this two-sided taxonomy, but also um, to borrow some language from Sara Ahmed, denying the alterities within those two categories. It doesn't let us see that within these categories, there's actually many different kinds of writing. Um, and so part of what I'm trying to do in the curation of the series is to bring together writers who engage with writing in many, many different ways that include computation, but aren't limited to those categories, right? Um, and I'm doing this specifically to point out that writing isn't methodologically just one thing, right? It's always accomplished with tools. And some of these tools bleed into computation and some of them don't. Um, 
So here I have this just like a main a mind map that I made. It's not like meant to be comprehensive in any way. Uh, and I put writing in the middle of this, but I want you to imagine like this, this field of connected nodes expands out into infinity and none of these things is central, but writing is connected to many of them. Um, so what I'm, what I'm trying to show is that, you know, writing is just one of the many disciplines in this rhizome. And, you know, not all of the participants in the series consider themselves to be primarily poets or even to be writers. Um, but I think all of these things are usefully interrelated. All of these tools, you know, bleed into each other. Um, so I think that it's useful to bring together these writers that use computation, but don't necessarily center computation to show as we move into this like post large language model world, um, that computational writing isn't limited by just that one side of the equation, just the open AI side of that taxonomy. Um, so hopefully that's that's clear and interesting to everyone. Even if it isn't, uh, I think you'll find the readings themselves to be clear and interesting. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our first reader. I must bring up the, um, the biographies that I was supplied. Um, and I am just reading from the biographies that people supplied. I might interject some of my own commentary. Uh, first up is uh, Harry Josephine Giles. Um, it is a soft G, right? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, who like is a, what's that? Like in Buffy. Okay, all right, got it, exactly. <laughs> um, so Josie is a writer and performer from Orkney, Scotland. Her verse novel, Deep Wheel Arcadia, was published by Picador in October 2021 and won the 2022 Arthur C. Clarke Award for Science Fiction Book of the Year. Her poetry collections, The Games and Tunget, were between them. Uh, shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best First Collection, the Saltier Prize for, and the Edwin Morgan Poetry Award. She has a PhD in creative writing from the University of Stirling. Her show Drone debuted in uh, the Made in Scotland Showcase at the 2019 Edinburgh Fringe and toured internationally. And her performance, What We Owe, was picked by The Guardian's Best of the Fringe 2013 Roundup in the But Is It Art category. Um, Josie is one of the writers that I most admire in the world. Um, and I don't know if she's sick of hearing this uh, by now or not, but Deep Wheel Arcadia is a truly wonderful novel. Um, and when I heard that it won the Arthur C. Clarke Award, I had this like feeling of relief that something had gone right in the world for this novel that I think is just incredible. Um, uh, Josie has been working with Ava Para who is a researcher, educator, and printer. She is part of the curatorial collective Indisciplinadas, uh, where she has developed ex exhibitions such as No Room for Books and Soft Cover Revolution. She is the co-founder of Calypso Press, a printing studio, publishing label, and artistic collective, uh, publishing label and artistic collective established in 2015 in Cali. And since 2022, based in New York, Calypso hosts a residency, a residency program oriented to expanded publishing and printing experimentation. They have participated in art book fairs such as uh, NYABF, I forget what the A in that stands for, uh, art book fair, New York art book fair. Um, Unfold Shanghai, uh, Libros Mutantes Madrid, uh, Replica Mexico, I'm assuming that the multiple R's are intended to encourage me to lean into that. Um, and curated contemporary art projects such as post-digital mimeography and a sketch for the future. So I will invite Josie to take the floor now. Hello, hi, and um, well, hello from the, the 58th parallel, as I was just saying before we started. I'm at home in Orkney at the moment, um, which if you don't know, is the islands off the north coast of Scotland. Um, where it is currently 10 to midnight and the sun has kind of set, sort of, um, and the moon is out and the sky is a sort of a warm kind of navy blue at the moment. So that's that's where I'm coming to you from. Um, forgive me for being a little bit, uh, because it is 10 to midnight and I usually go to bed at nine. Um, oh dear. So I'm going to, I want to, I'm going to read them some of the, the poem that Ava's worked with to make this beautiful, beautiful broadside. Um, and then I'm going to go on a little walk through some other things that I've done with um, 
procedure and computation, um, both using computers and, and not using computers, to think a little bit about how that shows up in, in, in my own work. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share a screen um so partly so you can kind of see some poems in their in their context. Um but before I do that, um a couple of these that I'm going to read from uh, are, are, are sort of poems that were first made as, as Twitter bots. And that one of the reasons that I am delighted that Ava chose um, this, this one poem, We Are Rain, to work with is that it's the last of my Twitter bots that's still alive, um, I, I think. Most of them have died one by one as, as the high hegens at Twitter have gradually revoked permissions for various artistic uses of the platform. So this one is still kind of creaking on. I've had a notification that, go that the Google API that I used for it has been revoked. So it's gonna die sometime soon. And so this event acts as kind of a valediction for this, this poem that is soon going to stop making new poems. Um, and also a valediction for me from Twitter, which I've quit. So I'm not even on this platform anymore. And I, I leave behind me the detritus of dying Twitter bots, which is quite a nice way to leave a platform. So with that said, I'm now gonna share a screen of Twitter. Oh dear. Um, where are we? Here we are. So this is the one that I wanted to read from um, slightly experimentally, because as you can see, this is mostly sounds. And Eva has taken one of these generated texts and turned turned them into turned it into a beautiful broadside. So we are rain every hour on the hour um, spits out a new um, sound, an image, a visual sound poem that is for me the sound of rain. It's the first bot I ever made, and um, I don't entirely know how it works. It, it came about. I was trying to make it do something else, and then it started doing this, and I thought, well that's better. I should probably let it do that. Let's let it do that. And then I let it run until it broke, which it will soon. So I'm going to read um, a few hourly rains for you, which may be a bit messy. I'll try not to spray the camera. Here we go. We are rain. I don't even know if the Zoom mic is going to pick this up, but we're going to give it a go anyway, and you'll get some strange sounds. We are rain. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read another bot for you. This is nice reading bots. I've not I've not done this before. Um, and this next one I want to read is more of a sort of parody bot. It was it was made. Um, I had this wild month where there were um, Nano Genmo National Novel Generation Month is for me one of the most important regular um, celebrations of generative text. And I think it might be the first occasion where I saw Alison's work i think yeah i think it might well have been um and out of nano genmo came nabo genmo Na national bot generation month where people were challenged to make a bot a day every day for a month of november i think i might be the only person that ever did it um but i did it and i made these 30 bots all at once some of which were very very poor and some of which were a bit silly and this is one of them so here's a little parody of um Leonard Cohen for you. Everybody knows. And um, 
I had to, it, uh, amongst the things that I couldn't achieve in the day were making this rhyme properly and making all the verses come out correct. So um, you can have a look at it there and I'm going to read you. Here's one I made earlier. Um, here we go. Everybody knows the paste is ostrich. Everybody knows the ribbed lakes stared. Everybody knows the firms were climax. Everybody prides with their deltas blamed. Everybody knows the age was bade. The drunk say stay snug and the squared get stayed. That's how it flows. Everybody knows. Everybody knows the vice is desperate. Everybody knows the vague midst asked. And everybody knows that it's good or baggy. And everybody knows that it's us or you. Everybody knows the grad is postal. Clean, sharp gauges still coping coastal for your shieldings and rows. And everybody knows. And everybody knows that the seat is zooming. Everybody knows that it's conning hence. Everybody knows that the conscious cone and chuckle are just a lapping microchip of the past. Everybody knows that it's oozing upright. Take one last look at this wacky spite before it lows. And everybody knows. Everybody knows that the urn is getting. Everybody knows that the catfish mused. And everybody knows that you fret forever oh, when you've revved a rent or five. Everybody knows that the muse is svelte, but there's going to be a mischief on your felt that will foreclose what everybody knows. So that's everybody knows, which you can find at everybody knows. And the, the method there, if you're interested, is is um, take looking at the um, the syllable and stress patterns of the words in the original, and then using a corpus of words that that match those syllable and stress patterns, and in some places match with rhymes um, to to keep just churning out new verses of this Leonard Cohen song using the same stress pattern. But as you've heard. Sometimes the computer doesn't really know how a word is supposed to be said, and sometimes it can't fit the words in right. And for, for me, that's kind of part of the beauty of it, is both the nonsense that it turns out that veers kind of perilously close to meaning, and also the, the errors that it makes while it does that. So I wanna read one more generative text, and then I'm gonna to read to the a more human authored, and then I'll, I'll finish up. And so this is the last one in this browser. Um, auto dinner is a very silly bit of bad French um, that I made with a. Um, it's a. It's a, it, it follows on from a, a previous Twitter bot that I made called Auto Flaneur, and then um, and a food artist that I know called Steph Marsden asked if I would make some generative instructions for for making a meal and eating a meal to play with your food. So so we made this um, this computer generated guide for exploratory eating, which you can find it autodinner.neocities.org and then um, we're gonna we're gonna have a meal together it might be a good one it might be a bad one I don't know what instructions are about to come up as we do this so the fabulous eating experience generated title and each of these instructions is procedurally generated so just about anything could come up to get ready dedicate this meal to a loved one Gather together three tasty foodstuffs and several strange ingredients from anywhere but the kitchen with help from a friend. Decorate the table with foliage from outside. Take a dry mouthful and chew as quietly as you can for a while. Stroke the walls. Hold a bite of food in your mouth for a few too many seconds and then spit it out. Smear the remains on your face. To conclude, thank the day for its contribution to your meal time. So there's your meal. Every time you visit, you'll get a new meal. That meal will never again be revisited. So take a screenshot of those instructions if you want to follow them, or you can go to the site to get some new ones. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to PDFs now as we move from 
from um, texts where I've you really used a computer to text where it texts where it's mostly me, but actually they're very connected. Um, so this poem, which will be in my next book, which is coming out, my next poetry book, which is coming out next year, um, is a is a is I think a kind of generative text, and that what I've done is is taken a line from a poem that I really don't like, and um, I, just as I did with the the Leonard Cohen bot, um, looked at the looked at the mechanics of that line, how it works in its stresses and its rhythms, how it works in its internal sound patterning, and then varied the varied those elements of the poem on each line to generate a new sonnet well it's a sort of sonnet it's 14 lines um, using those same bits of patterning and a new image in each line so i haven't used a computer to do that work but i have used things like thesauruses and and rhyming dictionaries and stuff like that to keep working away at it so it's it's a human brain doing the same things that a computer would do but but a lot more slowly and with a bit more intervention so the first line, you can look it up if you want to know where it's from, although it's a horrible poem that it's from. And um, the rest of the lines are mine. I love to hear her speak. A cling peach slithering out of its tin. A lip gloss ground into paste by the teeth. A burnt clutch scribbling down from the past. A cow pat drilled by extravagant heels. A hangnail snatching a lark by the throat. A wire thong under a cage crinoline. A, a crazed screen slicing a covetous thumb. A quote tweet high on the sodium moon. A plum duff smelting its thruppany bit. A light bulb loose in a bucket of knives. A cheese string stubbornly whole in the pipes. A war pig through the dimensional gate. A salt lick slapping a jellyfish sting. A blessed base warily bowed at the bridge. The, the first, uh, the title of that, I should say, is, is from um, a Shakespeare sonnet. I forget which number, but um, in case you didn't recognise it, it's from the one that begins, um, My Mistress Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun. Um, so two more short poems, and then I'll, I'll hand over, I think, to Eva. Um, this is a poem from my first book, which, again, is, is another approach to generation, but again, human authored. And I'm not going to explain it because the title explains the entire poem. So, Poem in which nouns, verbs and adjectives have been replaced by entries from the Wikipedia page, List of Fantasy Worlds. You gore me, boxing in your sartorius delis and angius clen, to xanth, to zephyk as though an erd of baslag would termina under your high rule, as though I were charn already. Don't beckon to me. Don't tear like I'm lodos to your emelin blessed, like I'll zen when you tortle my devery tarth. Oh, I'd land over earthy with you, Panem. It's Arahon. You're still Milnibane. Your Eberin Oz and Eberinus Quinn are still Spira. I nurn you. But Falfa your Athos, and then you can hala me. Og Idris, Eidolon to purn me, Tamriel. Torn me till all my mundus orbis, one Glorantha Ea. So, final poem for me. Um, forgive me as I scroll rapidly through the PDF of my book, which uh, is going to take me a moment to get to the end. And we're going to we're going to go back to Twitter for my goodbye from Twitter. Uh, so it's it's quite a noisy, messy book. There's a lot of different things in it. You're getting a, a sneak preview. I probably shouldn't show you this because we haven't announced it yet. Here we go. Um, right. Don't let the poets see this. Um, Back to Twitter, uh, this poem is assembled from bits of language from the world of Twitter and it was, uh, it uses most of the tweets that I could find 
uh, that used the word, don't let the poet see this, which has become a sort of niche meme um, at the time of composing the poem. Don't let the poets see this. The breathing forest, the shyness of the crown. Earth is getting a black box under a tree's root system, pollinated by beetles. Together in the spring, a language similar to humans on their migration to the moon. An ice encaged rose, fireflies plus long exposure. The recent lava flow in Iceland, the star-shaped sand of Okinawa, the glistening waters of Jamaica, butterflies drinking turtle tears, Lake Michigan after an ice storm, soft serve outside Greenwich Observatory, they fall hard back into existence. A piece of your childhood, looking at myself in the mirror, something came in the night. I finally saw the moon. My clearest picture of a third quarter moon, the problem with the moon, the sexual tension between the moon and the ocean, the super moon freed the container ship down her throat by lunchtime. Some satellites just can't be caged. Clipboards at the laundromat, 74 gigabytes of data, a photocopy of her phone, writing poems is an activism, media not displayed, never going to emotionally recover. This image has been removed in response to a report from the copyright holder. Okay, thanks very much for having me. I'm really looking forward to the rest of the talks and readings and it's a pleasure to be here. And, and thank you to Alison and the Centre for Book Arts for having me, it's been a joy. Hi. Can you hear me? Perfect. So I'm Eva Parra. Um, I had the pleasure to work with Josie and make a broadside featuring one of uh, their project, their uh, poems. And I think I'm gonna uh, start sharing screen. And I will tell you a little bit of the process. So this is the broadside. I, ironically, I think I, uh, I wanted to work with the We Are Rain poem while serious because when I started working with Josie, I was presented with a poem that was in a language that I didn't uh, know. Uh, and it was very hectic for me. Like I went online and I started to use a translator and I couldn't really understand what that was about. So I had this overwhelming feeling of just like working with something that didn't mean anything to me, but I started to like bargain with the text and like trying to uh, extract some meaning out of it. And then uh, when I talked with Josie about this, he pre uh, they presented me with uh, some other poems and I fell in love with this series, the series of Rain. And I think it was because I was so overwhelmed with not understanding uh, anything about the poems that it felt really nice to work with um, onomatopoeias, like with the sound of the music. So I went from uh, being very lost in the language to uh, be, being very comfortable with something that I think it's very universal and that is the experience of rain. And um, this, final broadside that I ended up doing, it's a Riso print uh, broadside. For those who are not familiar with Riso, Riso it's kind of the daughter of a mimeograph and a photocopier machine. So actually I'm in the Riso studio and this is the machine I made the uh, broadside with. And uh, it's very, it's a very manual machine, but it's also uh, an electronic machine. So I'm uh, gonna show you a little bit of the process, but just to give you some numbers, this was made, was made with eight uh, inks. And what I did is that when you work with Riso, each of the colors goes printed separately. 
So you have to make a master for each color. So that means that I made eight masters. And what I did uh, was to um, combine uh, and shuffle the pages and put them some backwards. So I created different um, patterns. So this image that you're seeing here is one of the patterns of the more than 36 different uh, variations of the poem. So the text is always in the same position, like the black ink, it's always in the same position, but these are the dots that keep changing from uh, print to print. And when you print in Riso, like we Riso printers, we love to say that each of the uh, prints are different because of the little differences and the manual aspect of the uh, medium. But to be honest, like, they are quite similar, but they like change a little bit because Risa loves to jump a little bit and uh, it has like, you get a lot of problems with registration, but I wanted to achieve something that was really, really different from print to print. So I thought about uh, this idea and this is the whole idea of the, of the broad set. So whenever you buy one, you don't really know like what uh, kind of pattern you're going to get. And I wanted to uh, give up some of the control that I had over the, the design for this also because that had a lot to do with uh, rain and rain patterns. And when I started working in this uh, broadside, I, I charged myself with the duty of scanning rain. And this is what I was doing. So. Uh, time was precious because uh, the time forecast said that there was not going to be a lot of rain days in New York. So what I did is that I came to the studio a day that I thought that it was going to rain and it rained. And I, then I started to collect little uh, raindrops in a box and I went to the machine and scanned them. And this was one of the settings that I had to create to scan uh, things like this. You can see like the little raindrops here. And this image here may not seem like really stunning to you, but technically it was really, really hard. So I really got caught on in the process of scanning rain. And I was not as stuck with the results, but on the other hand, I was just kind of addicted to uh, how I could like make this uh, invisible things visible using this machine. So this was uh, the first um, kind of proposal that I gave to Josie. And I mean, it was working for me, but then I started to feel that it was too literal and that I wanted to do something also that was not so dark and that was kind of like more uh, playful. So I ended up with this um, idea of some, uh, I started to think of something that, some things that also like fall to the ground uh, as confetti or like any other stuff. So I came up with this uh, idea of the confetti and the pattern of the confetti that it's left on the ground when there's a party or there's a celebration. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, that was amazing. The, the reading was amazing, Josie, and thank you for that uh, for that wonderful explanation um, of your creative process. I thought that was uh, I don't know. I'm I'm amazed. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Janelle Shane, uh, who is working with Kelly Anderson. So uh, once again, we will engage in the. Uh, sacred ritual of the reading of the bios. Um, Janelle, uh, Janelle Shane's uh, AI humor blog, AIweirdness.com, and her book, You Look Like a Thing and I Love You, How AI Works and Why It's Making the World a Weirder Place, use cartoons and humorous pop culture experiments to look inside the artificial intelligence algorithms that run our world. Um, I have also been an admirer of uh, Janelle's work for a very long time, and just like the sustained experimentation with uh, artificial intelligence technologies over the past 
however many years, um, has been really a source of, of insight into these technologies. Um, Kelly Anderson uh, is an artist, designer, animator, and tinkerer who pushes the limits of ordinary materials to seek out possibilities hidden in plain view in humble materials. Her books and projects have included a pop-up paper planetarium, that's a fun phrase to say, uh, a book that transforms into a pinhole camera, a working paper record, and techniques for misusing Riso to create tactile, inky animations. Intentionally lo-fi, she believes that humble materials can provide an entry into the endless tunneling complexity of our world, making those wonders accessible on a multi-sensory rich human level. By opening black box concepts up to the poetics and playfulness of the senses, her projects function as a lab space for collaboration, thereby broadening accessibility and the diversity of voices at the table. She is currently completing Alphabet in Motion, an interactive book on the relationship between typography and technology with letter form archive. Um, Kelly is great. Uh, Kelly was a, a project fellow here at uh, where I work at ITPIMA at NYU and is one of the most popular people on the floor during that period um, and uh, has an amazing Instagram that you should follow if you don't already. <laughs> Uh, so I will, um, well, actually, before I let them go, I want to say that uh, having Janelle and Kelly collaborate with each other is such an amazing outcome from this work, because I think that it's just a really, uh, a really high energy combination um, between people whose work I, I really admire and respect. Um, so I will invite Janelle to take the floor. Hey, thanks so much, Allison, for that introduction and for the in invitation. It's been really fun seeing the huge variety of different things people have done with text and generative text and all these things. Uh, just a just a huge world out there, this whole spectrum that you showed in between good old human writing and open AI, AI UG. And my tool of choice for this, the stuff that went into this broadside is the open AI UG and like straight up large language model, uh, model too big for fine tuning. So this is just a grab bag of the internet that I am dealing with and trying to get something out of some kind of insight, some kind of entertainment. And, uh, I learned a lot about what goes into these these models in the process. Uh, one of the things I discovered pretty quickly is that in order to get something entertaining, you know, you should basically run in, on, in the other direction from the people who are using these models as discount humans. And this sort of, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll spam the submission uh, inbox of Clark World and see if we can make a big uh, quick buck and all of these. Let's replace our valuable mental health help helpline with this chat bot. I'm sure this will go well. Oh no, it instantly didn't. Like that's one end of working with these models. And I tend to go digging for the glitches, the places where it's not looking quite like human generated text and where it starts to show these differences, these shortcomings, this disconnect of form from actual meaning. And uh, I, and I, I really like uh, Ted Chang's vision of these big large language models as a you know compressed version of internet text. And so what I'm really doing in a sense is digging into the compression artifacts. So I'm going to be showing uh, the experiment that went into this broadside. Uh, and this is one that Allison suggested and uh, I'm really delighted to see how this turned out. Uh, and I, uh, this particular thing, I'm going to show, share my screen now. Oops, it is disabled. I'm, oh, uh, that's because I popped back my, my internet and stuff. So let me know when I could do it. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll, I'll at least kind of, I'll let my slides catch up in a second. But this topic is utopias. And the idea 
you know, I'm sort of playing with the idea that people are trying to, you know, think of what would happen if AI, whatever that is, is imagining the future. And so I wanted to play with this and say, okay, what about some utopias generated uh, via large language model? So it looks like my share screen is on. So I will share this window. Can you see it? Someone give me a thumbs up and then not cool. We're good. All right. So utopias, I said, that's my project. So this particular project uh, experiment dated from March, 2022. And my tool of choice in this case was OpenAI's GPT-3. And what exactly that means is fuzzy because of course they're changing the model and what even went into it, we don't know that hasn't been released. It's an interesting, it's not a very good scholastic tool, but you can get some interesting things about it if you poke at it in the right way. So here's what I did. This, these models work by completing text. For those of you who, who haven't played around with them themselves, basically the way, one way I think of it is, it's trying to re reproduce internet text. So you are giving it the beginning of a chunk of text that has appeared on the internet or that you know, could appear on the internet and it's trying to predict the most likely completion. And so how you set up your text, what tone you use, what framing you use, what kind of web page you are beginning this improv by invoking will really determine what you get. So in this particular case, these are, this is how I set it up. I said, this is a list of utopias and short descriptions. In one co what context, we don't know, but here are the utopias. And I set up uh, one is the agrarian utopia where everyone lives on a farm and there is plenty to eat. The geese are a menace, but otherwise life is good. And then I also set up a techno utopia as an example in which sophisticated 3D printers make us everything we want. Occasionally they glitch and we get chocolate socks, but at least they're tasty. So, Real utopias, you know, you, you got to have your chocolate sock glitches and you just got to deal with it. That's life in a utopia. And so I want to share with you some of the completions then that I got. Uh, so we have uh, the robot in utopia in which robots do everything for us automatically. Occasionally they attack us with lasers, but otherwise it is a nice place. Or zombie utopia uh, in which my clicky is not working. There we go. The zombies take over, but the way they do it is clever. And the background radiation for the nuclear power plant is no longer a problem. What I really like is I got some of these out, out of here that I probably would not have expected or thought of. Like these are the compression artifacts. These are the, this is not quite human text. Here's one of the first examples where in the magical utopia, we've got a wizard living in the shed who occasionally comes out to do magic and eat cheese sandwiches. He has a very limited repertoire of spells, but at least it keeps the goats happy. Uh, then we have the Burnination Utopia. Okay, the all of the internet is in there and that includes Homestar Runner. So here everything is burning, but it's all very controlled and everyone wears his best as tight pants. Uh, then we have things that I would get that kind of de deviated from my uh, template a little bit in which, for example, there is no utopia. This place sucks. One robot makes the entire place go and even he's on the fritz. Or the Paranopal Utopia, a world very much like our own, but with an inconvenient poltergeist that makes a really mess of everything. And sometimes it's all good news. In the nature utopia, the goats are carrying parasols and enjoying picnics in the seed pod forests. And in the kitten utopia, everyone wants to have a kitten. Please let me have a kitten. This is the kitten utopia. So we are, we are starting to deviate <laughs> from, from, my, uh, from my initial paragraphs that I set up. And I kind of encourage this by feeding its own generations, like the ones that I like, I'm only picking like one in 10 uh, at max and feeding it back in, appending it to the end of this list that it is now completing. And I have to be very careful at what I append. Like if there's anything in there that has any hint of violence or anything that's like politically topical, it changes this into another kind of, of uh, virtual web page and 
you know, if I'm getting it to generate several lines at once and the first line de deviates into conspiracy theory territory, you might as well forget the rest of it because it'll just dive into those weeds. So there's definitely a back and forth curation I'm doing and what I'm allowing to be one of the utopias on this imaginary website web page. I thought about this one in which it's not quite a utopia, but uh, it was kind of interesting to think of you, Australia moving to the North Pole, it cooling itself down and becoming paradise. And the bits utopia in which everything is bits, bits, bits. There is an excess of poetry, but inside every bit is another bit and we're always exposed to bits from the past. The Norse utopia in which assuming you start near the top of the tree when you fall off, there is ankle support almost all of the way down. Furthermore, the squirrels are making a new tractor. So, you know, these start to get, some of them don't make sense. Uh, I have also tried, one of the knobs I have to experiment with is to use a smaller, smaller and smaller versions of GPT-3. So this is the second largest in which the coherence is, really takes a hit. So we have the applesauce utopia. Quantum shearing maintains everyone's hair nicely. If a few people go bald, they just have newspapers printed with computer facial filters. The Avarianarian utopia. Different birds live different lives. Weather changes the ooze into perfect snack for each species. Or the post-industrial utopia. We make our own medicine with robots. Every Tuesday, someone snip, slips on the banana skin. We get one more robot. Open source world. The doves built a network to the ladies in their backyard. The parrots built a feed line to the threshers in the desert. Nutshells, utopia, sounds nuts. While the world is running very efficiently, it is not always why we came to Green Mama. Usually, we come here and speak with in-house Zen masters until our rigor is dashed, and then we leave. I like this one, hair utopia. Everyone on earth has Superman-like hair and every conversation starts with a bizarre hair-related joke. I now regret I did not start this reading with a bizarre hair-related joke. It would have been a great callback. And my last, uh, no, this is not the last utopia. I have a couple more. The cactus utopia. If we're in a dead zone, we'll grab a cactus and a bug scope, tames the bugs for our harvest. The mermaid utopia. Mermaids and eight-legged octopods mock us as they all wear cute costumes and beautiful lipstick and are fantastic performers. So, you know, this one, even Curie sometimes managed to fit with my format. We've got the upside, cute costumes, beautiful lipstick, fantastic performers, and we have this downside. They, alas, mock us because we are not all of this all the time, I guess. Or maybe they just mock us. Finally, we have... I'm going to end with this one, the dreamless city. Is this a utopia? All the city lights have burned out and we've got nice big sandboxes with no sun up in the sky. This is, a according to GPT-3, this is a statistically probable utopia and belongs on this list of statistically probable utopias, uh, or so it seems. So that's my last utopia I wanted to share with you folks. Uh, now, next, um, it, you, we'll switch to Kelly Anderson and you'll get to see the, prod, the broadside that she made out of these utopias and oh my gosh, it is so cool looking. You gotta see this. You're gonna see it in a second. Here we go. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you so, so much. I, Allison, yeah, I'm really grateful that you put Janelle and I um, together because it was such a great opportunity. Uh, if you all aren't familiar with Janelle's blog or Janelle's Twitter, uh, you can get lost there for hours and hours and days. There's so much interesting stuff. And um, I loved these utopias because for many reasons. I mean, obviously they're, they're hilarious, but, um, I think a lot of times when you, you know, talk about AI, you think like, oh, this is like a, a departure from like firsthand human experience in a way, but all of these utopias, you can't help but like 
create a simulation in your brain of like, what would it feel like to be in this mermaid utopia and be mocked constantly every day? So I really love that. Um, okay. I'm going to share my screen here and just show you, show you this broad side. Okay. My box is drawn a little bit big, but that's okay. Um, yeah. So I ended up making a Vauvel uh, broadside because like one of the astute observations that Janelle made that's like built into the structure of all of these utopias is that, you know, like all human utopias, there's something great and attractive about it that brings people to this utopia. And then there's also like some intolerable trade-off, you know? So, you know, you might get to live in paradise with a whole bunch of other, you know, beautiful people, but at the end, everyone drinks the Kool-Aid or whatever, you know, like there's always, there's always something. Um, so I, I love that, that consistency that, um, you know, runs through it, which I know, I know Janelle intentionally programmed, but, um, I thought a Vauvel would be a great format for this because then it kind of turns it into, almost like a, like the trolley problem. Like you have to intentionally select your utopia, but by doing that, you have to simultaneously select this intolerable trade-off that your, uh, that your, you know, comes, comes part and parcel with the good. Um, so my favorite, my favorite utopia is the Superman hair utopia where <laughs> everyone has Superman hair. But as soon as you select that, then you realize, oh my gosh, I have to put up with mandatory hair jokes for the rest of my known life. Um, so, so yeah, this is um, this was also printed on the Rizzo. Uh, unlike Eva, I only used one color, so I was a little bit lazy. I used this metallic gold, which mimics pretty effectively this far more expensive process of. Um, of hot foil stamping. And so was intending to do that. Uh, and then there's also this, this black, it almost looks like a spot gloss, which is also normally a pretty expensive process. And this is actually like laser printing, like at the machines at FedEx office. So um, laser toner has a little bit more of a glossy reflective look to it, finish. And so when it goes through the machine, it later on, it was just like a little bit blacker in the paper and a little bit more shiny, which was exactly like the level of gloss that I wanted. Um, and part of the reason for using this kind of like rich materials, the gold and the gloss, even though I used kind of a less expensive version of them, was to... Um, sort of build something that looked almost like a Greek pantheon and go back to the original like Latin meaning of utopia. Um, because if you, if you look at, you know, the etymology of the world word utopia, uh, it comes from, and I'm going to have to read it off of here. Um, hold on one second. Let me, let me get it up here. Yeah. So it comes from the Greek um, o, <laughs> o, U, which means not, and the Greek topos, which means place. So it basically means no place or nowhere, um, which the word was formed as a pun because it's almost identical to the Greek word eutopos. So E-U topos versus O-U topos. Um, and E-U topos means a good place. Uh, so just, I don't know, I thought that that was like a really interesting, like there were poetic dimensions, um, in that etymology in and of itself that were worth like printing on there too, but, um, definitely had a lot of fun with this one. And yeah, I don't think I have that much more to say, but does anyone have any questions, like any production questions or laser printing questions or anything like that? So they were laser cut. That was a, yeah. <laughs> the magic of this technology is in two die cut layers. Um, and I think that there is like some kind of like nice drama and the content being like revealed slowly um, and revealed, you know, uh, 
by empowering the user to turn it with their own hand and land on these utopias um, and force them to pick one, which, you know, I think there's a lot, a lot of rightful debate on like which one you would actually want to live in. Um, probably everyone who plays with a Spovel would pick a different one as being the, the tolerable uh, utopia to exist in. So, so yeah, I think that's, I think that's all I have here. So um, yeah, thank you all so much for inviting me to do this. It was really just so fun. <laughs> um, thank you, Janelle and Kelly. That was great. Um, uh, I'm going to be thinking about that kitten utopia for a really long time. <laughs> and I was, um, I don't know, watching watching your Instagram stories, Kelly, and just wondering how you got those like ultra luxurious effects on the paper um, within the budget that was allocated. Um, so it's super to hear about your, uh, super interesting to hear about your process. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you. the reason is kind of amazing because it's like a photocopier price, mm -hmm. but you can get gold. Right. <laughs> so recommended. <laughs> so cool. It looks like some kind of artifact. Like yeah. I can't tell if it looks ancient, it looks futuristic, but I, uh, the vibe. Is so good. Yeah. It's also interesting because it like Volvels are also uh, a traditional medium for making generative text. Like if you look back into the, the 1600s, 1700s in Europe, it's like a method for producing text that have these combinatorial aspects to have it juxtaposed with these with these large language model generated text, I think is a super interesting juxtaposition. Um all right, thank you. Oh, Kelly, did you have something else to say? I was just, I just, I was departing in my head of this fantasy of like, I wonder if there's any way that you could accurately model even like a very simple text generator out of layers of paper, if it would help mm -hmm. us like tactile learners, like understand the structure of like where the, the yeah. words come from or yeah, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. all I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah. I think you definitely could. I think it's possible to try. Um, all right, so our next pair is um, Kayalata McDowell and Valentina Amestica. Uh, so I'm going to read the bios. Kayalata McDowell is a writer, speaker, and musician. They are the author with GPT-3 of the books Pharmaco AI, A More Cringe, and Air Age Blueprint. Their sound healing neuroscience opera Song of the Ambassadors premiered at Lincoln Center in 2022. They record and release music under the name Kenrick uh, with a Q. Uh, a lot of McDowell established the Artists and Machine Intelligence Program at Google AI. They are a conference speaker, educator, and consultant to think tanks and institutions seeking to align their work with deeper traditions of human understanding. Kay was working with Valentina, as I mentioned. In an experimental line, Valentina develops her work between printing, typography, graphics, art installations, and poetry. With studies in graphic design in Chile and experimental printing, binding, and letterpress in central St. Martin's, London. Her works present crosses that address sensory issues, the fragility of memory, and personal and everyday experiences. Um, so it looks like Kay wasn't able to join us this evening, so I am going to read the text of the broadside here, um, and then I'll hand it over to Valentina to uh, tell us about the broadside. So give me a second to bring up the window that I had with the text of the broadside. Um, all right. <clears throat> Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my window so you can see the text of the meeting. Just to give it a bit of context. All right. <clears throat> when I say your name, as you might look at yourself from the outside, looking at yourself as a person, what else can I do but look at you from the outside? Everything else is false. It's how I know it's a reflection. I know it's a reflection because I'm not seeing you. But I am looking at you when I see you as you see yourself. I'm looking at myself as you might look at yourself. And as I look at myself, 
I see you. Um, so Valentina, I will give the floor to you. Hi, are you listening? Yes. Um, when I was given the task of designing the broadside, I immediately started thinking about the different ways that a poem can be understood so and interpreted. So I want to visually convey these various possibilities in subtle manner, while also in my readers to explore a poem on their own unique ways. So that why like the different sides on the text. So to begin my creative process, I style K. Alado's work to better understand the world he portrayed in his writings. So I then managed to connect his style with my graphic design approach. Well, I think that information, I'm gonna share my screen, sorry. Um, So, okay, so that's why like, you can evoke a sense of mystery and poetry on the broadside. So that's like the thing that Kay Alado works and my work like make like a match. So the final design serve as an invitation uh, the print capture the essence of the employees of visual cues and invite readers to discovering new meanings of collection. They was like very difficult because we use three colors and I have to ask for Eva's help because it's the research expert. And it was so difficult because we have to match the text with the other layers. So this is like the example of when we, did you see like the, when we could match the text with all the layers. And this is the final result. And I use also like analog techniques for make the, the design press, like letterpress. It's a like all technique with, you can like trust the letters. And that's it, I think. Great, thank you, Valentina. Um... Actually, one of the things that I like about Riso is the is those like slight little um, registration gaps that you get. Um, just kind of reminds you of material process. Um, so I think that's it for the for the readers for the evening. I think uh, if there are any questions or if people want to have a discussion, we have a bit of time for that now. I do have a kitten with me. <laughs> so speaking of kitten utopia, I have one. <laughs> that is all. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. Well, I want a kitten. Please let me have a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kitten utopia. <laughs> well, I wanted to thank everyone for their work and for putting all of this together. Uh, and Allison, it's been really, really amazing working with you and learning. It's been a, a new experience for many of us at Center for Book Arts to learn about these uh, poets and uh, artists that are not all of them exactly poets, but there is like learning about the poetry in uh, programming bots and uh, and what you were talking about before this uh learning about these elements uh about how it's not uh 
exactly an opposition between human generated text and uh, uh, computer generated text, but more of a spectrum where uh, tools are, you know, used and uh, different statuses are generated at the same time. So I wanted to thank you and thank the poets and artists for their participation and uh, let everyone know that our um, the, the broadsides are on the website and or if you come by Center for Book Arts, you're uh, welcome to see them and other broadsides that we've been producing for the last 20 years. So, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Camila. You've made this process uh, just really smooth and uh, very easy. I feel like in this uh, meeting, because I've been doing a lot of talking, it makes it sound like I did a lot of work and I really didn't. It was all, all the Center for Book Arts staff who, who made this happen um, from a logistical standpoint. So thank you so much for making this possible. Thank you. And as I just said, I hope to see you at the Center uh, in the future. Bye.